and when they came upon the clearing, the men were struck by fear, such that some among them began wailing, for the beast they had seen fall dead with their own eyes, the beast into which two score men had dispensed the contents of their rifles, was nowhere to be found. The beast of Gevudan had survived to vanish right before their very eyes. Unknown author, circa 1785. I've always been into the strange and the mysterious. Stories of unknown beasts and weird phenomena drove me to study science and when the reality of scientific work left me jaded and burnt out to journalism. I made my living writing about the weird and wonderful things that make our world so interesting, whether historical or current, and that takes me all over the country, sometimes even further abroad. It seems, though, that there is someone who doesn't want this story getting out. No one will touch it, and even my own blog was mysteriously shut down after I posted part of it there. And so I'm doing what any self-respecting freelancer would do, and turning to the wider internet. I have no idea who is suppressing it, or how or why, but I need to get it out there. The story came to me completely by accident. I was researching a historical piece involving a supposed medium who operated in the rural New South Wales in the 1800s. When I came across a tiny snippet on an internet forum, the basic gist of it seemed to be that this farmer had been losing cattle in gruesome fashion, and at an alarming rate, and had reached his wit's end. He provided little more information than that, but for some reason my intuition kicked in. I had planned to go out to the area anyway, do some interviews regarding my long dead medium, so a few extra kilometers and a few extra questions couldn't possibly hurt. Of course, I was slightly wrong about that. I sent the man a private message, wondering if he would ever even see it, and packed up the laptop. Time to go. The drive out of Sydney would take quite a few hours and I wanted to make it by nightfall. Most city folk find the drives away from Sydney boring, except maybe for the coast roads. Once you clear the city and the mountains, if you happen to be heading far enough west, it's just endless rolling hills. Some of them are nothing but pastures, others nothing but brown-green bushland, and beyond those hills you hit the plains, for miles in every direction nothing but dirt and pasture, dotted with ancient gums. Personally, I think the dry country is every bit as beautiful as the more popular parts of Australia, and I always loved driving through it. When I arrived at my destination, a small town some 150 kilometers north of Griffith, the farmer had in fact sent me an email. He told me that he'd received no other responses, and that the killings had actually stopped in the months since his post. Still, he was just as puzzled as he had been originally, and keen to talk about it. I told him where I was staying and he promised to meet me the next day. I spent the morning researching my medium piece, but once I sat down with the farmer, I realized that I might have to take a back seat to this new story. He and his wife met me downstairs at the country pub where I was staying. After introductions, Jack and his wife, uh, Mary, the names obviously changed, sat down with a beer and told me and my recorder their tale. It started several months earlier. Jack had woken with the sun, as usual, and headed out to feed the cattle. There's not as many cattle farmers as sheep farmers out that way, but pasture is pasture, and plenty of relatively small hole grazers like Jack make it work. When he went out to the main paddock, though, he noticed that the majority of the cattle beyond the fence had crammed into the far corner near the gate. That's weird behavior. Cattle might live in a herd, but... They still like their space. I've seen them modeling up like that during a storm or whatnot, but they get scared, so I straight away figure something was up. 
Couldn't have guessed what, though. From there, Jack went deeper into the paddock, heading to the feeders with his load of feed. That's when he saw why the cattle had huddled in the corner of the fence line. I saw the crows first, but I knew what they meant. The way they were all down on the ground. We lose a few every year, part of the job. So I drove over there to see what had happened. Can't have an illness going through the herd, for example. So I needed to work out why that steer had kicked it. He took a big gulp of his beer, shaking his head subtly at the memory. It wasn't no illness that killed that steer, though. The oot scared off the crows, and all I seen was blood. Blood and meat. Looked like a butcher's shop on mince-making day. It occurred to me later I should have snapped some pictures, but didn't think of it at the time. Anyway, this fucking steer had been torn to bits. One leg over here, a head over there, another leg over there, somewhere. Wasn't much big meat left either. Some had a good feed and none too fancy table manners. Now, out here, there's nothing I know of that would do that. We got a problem with feral dogs like most farming communities, but taking a full-grown healthy steer from a herd. I didn't want to say it had never happened, but i never seen it. We got baits on the property too, and never seen a dog for maybe two years. Obviously at the time, Mary and I still reckon that's the most likely culprit, right? So I lay more baits, move the cattle out of that paddock, and don't think much more of it. Jack got up to order another round at this point and Mary and I made small talk in the interior. Where was I? Right. Next few weeks, we lost a few more the same way. Started to look like a problem, but we couldn't do a lot. Wouldn't say it was real regular, either. Sometimes two days between them, sometimes four or five. Folks around here, town, suggesting stuff like patrolling the place at night, but that's not gonna work when you've got bust your balls for ten hours on no sleep sit in one of them massive stations. I employ one part-time stocky, and my son helps out when things get hectic. Otherwise, it's all me. So we reported it to the coppers. Weird thing was, locals were happy to look into it, but once they called in for some expert help, it all got stonewalled. Cops dropped it like a warm beer, told us to leave it be. Anyway, one night, there's a god-awful commotion outside the house. We had some cattle in the house, paddock, ready to move in the morning. And about 1 a.m., they start kicking up all sorts of hell. So I grab the rifle out the gun safe and go out the back deck. It's dark as the inside of a dog, so I don't see much. But I can see the steers all gunning it towards one end of the paddock. Then off to the left, there's this sound, right? Like, like a crunching, tearing sound. By this point, I'm pretty much packing it. But I grabbed a mag light from next to the back door and shine it out that way anyway. Another big swig of his beer, and his hands were shaking. Mary rests a hand on his shoulder. Took me a second to work out what I'm looking at, but there's definitely something there. Big. It's just a dark shape, but when the light hits it and turns to me, I realize I was looking at the back end of it. It got the head of a steer in its mouth, torn clear off, but it's a long way off. I can't make a lot of details out. Just the rough size of it, maybe seven or eight foot. It's covered in black fur. Big eyes, too, reflecting the torch. Went from orange to green as it moved. Bit like a dog or fox's eyes. But no dog or fox is that tall. Didn't like the light, though made to come at me, so I shot at it. Honestly reckon I missed the thing, but I did the job anyway. Wherever that thing was, it dropped on all fours and shot through. Mary spoke up then. The next day we reported it to the police, but they didn't seem very interested. A few days later we got a visit from a couple of federal police fellows from Canberra. They were nice, but they assured us that whatever Jack had seen must have been a misidentification, and that folks had been tracking a big pack of feral dogs to the area. Jack scoffed at that. I could cop the misidentification, maybe. I happily admit I was shitting my pants, and 
that can fuck with you. But you tell me why two feds need to come all the way up here and tell me it was a dog. We got the locals. We got rangers. So why two guys from Canberra need to come out for a pack of dogs? The man had a point. I couldn't think of a good reason for the AFP to even concern themselves with some cattle deaths and feral dogs. Didn't matter in the end. Never saw the thing again, though I did find a couple of roofs torn up at the very edge of the property the next week. Since then, not a hair. Whatever it might have been, looks like it moved on. Heard tell of something else though. A week or two again, something bad. I gently prompted him to continue as he looked around, as though making sure no one else was listening. My son, he helps me out sometimes, but he's got a real job too. Works out in Griffith as a sales rep for one of the wineries. He was a couple of towns over, shilling booze as he does, when he heard this story. A couple of days before a farmhand went missing out on one of the properties. Good kid, never in any trouble. Found his four-wheeler smashed up in one of the paddocks. No sign of him. Figured he must have rolled it or something, struggling off to get help. Except that there were no tracks leading away from it. So they spread out, looking for a sign. And they did find a track. But it wasn't from the young fella. At this point, Jack pulled out his phone. Managed to get me a pic of what they found. Sent through by my son ground to my place too dry for any real sign lately, unless you're an indigenous tracker or some shit maybe, but out there, they got a few tracks. Here, take a gander. Jack handed his phone over and I almost dropped it in shock as the picture registered in my head. Smudges and smearing made it difficult to identify the exact kind of animal, but it was an image of a paw print. That much was clear. Possibly canine, based on the overall shape, but if the scale item against it was real, then that meant the track in the photo had to be at least 20 centimeters long. I found myself needing a drink too. This is Australia. What the fuck sort of animal has a foot that big? <laughs> They had shot a wolf, an impressive specimen, but the beast described in the attacks around Gevodan did not resemble a wolf, and the villagers were unconvinced. They knew a wolf when they saw it, and none had ever met a wolf that could survive the barrage of ammunition their beast had sustained. When they cut the belly of the wolf open, a more gruesome task, I'm sure, the villagers were sure. The last attack had been mere hours earlier, yet no human remains could be found. The king and his men insisted they had killed the culprit, but the villagers around Gevodan still looked at the dark forest with fear. The beast of Gevodan in their eyes still lurked somewhere out there. Thomas Walter Blake, in a personal letter, 1770. I'm sure you can see why this case sucked me in. Even if it wound up being nothing, as someone who had been obsessed with the unexplained for my whole life, the parallels between this and other cases were hard to ignore. A whole lot of beastly encounters with unknown, vicious creatures had happened over the years, and there was a chance I might be smack in the middle of another. I had to visit the farm, where the younger worker had disappeared. Jack gave me the address and I headed out there the next day. A couple of hours drive further west. There I met the owners, Terry and Grace, who were only too happy to put on a cup of tea and talk about their own strange experiences. Although they didn't agree to be recorded, and I had to take physical notes, I fashioned the below piece from those notes. It didn't start with Tom. The young farmhand's disappearance was the zenith of the activity but it came after a fortnight or so of strange occurrences. First, Terry found every single chicken on the property slaughtered, or outright gone. It would have been easy to attribute that crime to foxes, or perhaps the seemingly ubiquitous feral dogs. 
except that an entire corrugate iron wall section had been torn off the large coop. Not many foxes can do that. Next came the cries, chilling sounds emanating from the bush behind the farm. They came late at night, carried on the still air, deeply resonant and almost demonic. Terry and Grace both heard them, as did several workers, and no one could honestly say they'd ever hear anything similar before. If not for the volume and the massive timber, the howls could almost be mistaken for a dingo. Although dingoes had been wiped out many years earlier in this area, but the coughing roars and the chattering, undulating wails were not those of any animal that had ever been heard in Australia, native or otherwise. Grace described it as being how she had always imagined the sound of hellhounds, or perhaps the infamous hound of the Backervilles. There was a wrongness about it that came through loud and clear with every call. They stopped going out at night, and then stopped locking up the guns. Laws be damned. Over the course of about a week, the sounds came and went. Sometimes they sounded unbearably close, and others they seemed to be carried from miles and miles away. Then Terry started finding corpses in the paddocks. Unlike Jack's cattle, these corpses seemingly weren't the result of predation. Terry runs massive herds of sheep, and for whatever reason, they started turning up decapitated. The corpses were otherwise unmolested, each sporting one massive traumatic injury that removed the head. They were also found in strange places, paddocks and yards without stock, hanging on fences or the climbing pegs on power poles, on top of the hay bales in the feed paddocks, and even on top of a water tank somehow. And chillingly, one morning, Terry walked out the front door to find four decapitated kangaroos neatly lined up on his porch, thick blood seeping into the wooden deck. For most people, that might have been the last straw, but Terry and Grace live off the land, and if they fled even for a few days, it could have cost them thousands in income. So they stayed. They offered their three workers the opportunity to head into town, but all three refused. The morning of his disappearance, Tom woke early and ate in the kitchen, overlooking the paddocks all the way to a range of small hills several miles away. When Terry rose about half an hour later, Tom said he'd seen a large dark shape moving in the dawn light, down by the creek. He resolved to head out on a four-wheeler once the sun was higher to see if he could find any solid evidence of what they might be dealing with, anything that might help them get rid of it. Terry was reluctant to let him go. They had been waiting until later in the day to go outside, and they had been using the oots in case they came upon anything. But Tom was insistent, and at about 10 a.m., he gathered a few things into a pack and left. When he hadn't returned by 3 p.m., Terry became concerned. He and another worker, Grant, took one of the old oots out and followed the creek, hoping to find Tom. They came across the four-wheeler, right near the boundary of the property and the bush, irreparably damaged. Terry knew right away that something awful had happened to his young employee. The idea that he must have crashed, as relayed later by Jack a few hours away, came from the townsfolk. Of course, he could have crashed, but that couldn't have been all that had happened. The four-wheeler showed signs of an attack, for lack of a better word. Two tires were shredded, as though by massive teeth, and certainly not a result of the gentle, pastoral terrain. One wheel was torn off and laid quiet a distance away, and what looked like claw marks raked over the red paint. Terry, fearful though he was, immediately began searching for tracks. If Tom was still out there, he would be in serious danger. That's when they found the huge prints. There were five semi-distinct impressions, and many more others that were no more than marks on the ground where something heavy had passed through. All five were smeared, heavily, potentially distorting their true size. But there was no doubt that even at half the size of the actual impression of the foot would have been far larger 
than any animal currently found anywhere in Australia, bearing maybe and emu. And it certainly didn't come from an emu, a bird whose size belies how light it actually is. These tracks were made by something big, something solid and heavy. As much as he feared for Tom, Terry refused to follow those tracks into the bush. Instead, he called the police, but they couldn't make it out until the next morning. By then, there was no sign of Tom. Terry told the police everything that had been happening. He showed them the decapitated carcasses and the tracks, and being local, they demonstrated a real concern. A search party looked over for Tom for two days before someone found his pack, soaked in blood, on a game trail some five kilometers from where the four-wheeler had been found. The search went on for another day or two, but was called off soon after. Tom wasn't officially dead until a body could be found. But like so many who go missing in the Australian bush, there seemed to be little hope. As the search came to an end, two AFP officers in plain clothes visited the farm in a curious parallel to the case with Jack a few towns over. They claimed to have been in the area and compelled to help with the search, but no one actually saw them out in the bush. Stranger, they were seen loading one of the decapitated sheep into the boot of their car before driving out of town. While something terrible had clearly happened to Tom, his disappearance seemed to signal the end of the strange events. The monstrous sounds stopped immediately, and no more headless corpses turned up, apart from a few that had obviously escaped notice originally, judging by the level of decay. Terry and Grace mourned the young man they knew in their hearts had been killed by something that shouldn't have been there, but whatever it was, it seemed to have moved on. They hadn't seen any evidence of it since, and no one else around town had either. For them, at least, the nightmare seemed to be over. Terry and Grace were lovely people, and they made a great afternoon tea, but I couldn't help feeling unfulfilled as I left their farm and headed back to my accommodation. They had much more activity than Jack, who apparently frightened the creature off completely when he shot at it that night. And yet... I had no further answers, just a lot more questions. Why did whatever Terry and Grace encounter make so much noise, when Jack described it as moving through the night in complete silence? Why did it kill, but not feed? And why did it put the bodies in the places it did? Why did it seemingly attack and kill Tom when it fled from Jack? Tom had been armed too. Were they even the same creature? It seemed unlikely that two large, unknown and terrible creatures would pop up in almost the same area. None of it made a lot of sense, but as it turned out, the creature was far from finished. I would get more information sooner than I might have expected. The men found Marie by the river face down in the shallow water of the margins. The sight was said to have turned the stomachs of even the bravest among them, the raging stump of her neck still fresh and bleeding. They needn't approach any further, for the evidence was clear. The beast of Gevudan had returned. Excerpt from a story related to Boris Markarov, 1826. I had left my number with Jack and Mary and with Grace and Terry, and asked them to pass it on to anyone else who might have information for me. When my phone rang with an unknown number two days later, I did hope that it had to do with the strange beast that had quickly become my obsession. As I spoke to the woman on the other end of the line, my heart managed to both leap and sink at the same time. On the one hand, there had been another encounter. On the other, there had been another kill. And this time, there was a body. The attack had happened to the south this time. Given the amount of time that had passed since the events on Grace and Terry's farm, it seemed like the creature moved over long distances without too much trouble. It also seemed like I had underestimated the effects of this thing. The caller was a friend of one of the workers from the farm where Tom disappeared. 
and she even told me that my number had basically been given to everyone in town. They were all terrified of the monster that lurked in the dark, and there were so many more encounters. More pressing, obviously, was the body. In a breathless rush, my contacts told me the attack had happened at a river crossing. The victim, a 54-year-old man, had got out of his four-wheel drive, maybe to check the flow or the depth. Whatever the reason, he never got back in. His body was found next to the truck later on, when another driver came through. The contact said the man had been torn in two, and that his head wasn't found at the scene. Understandably, the poor soul who made the grisly discovery didn't hang around, and had since been treated for shock. And my contact said he'd be willing to talk to me. He he's shaken up, she said, but he's desperate to know what the hell is going on out there. We all are. But that wasn't even the most important piece of information. Jack hadn't seen the creature for a couple of months. Terry had his last incident several weeks earlier. This attack, though, had happened two days earlier. Interview with James Knox. Name changed. I've added this transcript in its totality because it's short. And because I felt like I shouldn't alter it. Okay, James. I've turned the recorder on, so we're being taped. If you change your mind about that at any stage, just let me know, okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, James. I understand that what you saw was very traumatic. So if at any stage you need to take a moment, uh, please feel free. James nods. Why don't you start by running me through what happened just before you got to the river crossing? Well, I was just on my way home, really. Sun was going down, and I had a rough day. Before you came to the actual scene, did you notice anything unusual? You know, I hadn't really thought much about that. I suppose everything was pretty normal. I gotta say, I was pretty zoned out, though. I drive that track every day, so I'm not always paying much attention. So there was no sign, then, of what was waiting for you up the road? No, I had nothing that sticks out. Just a normal drive home. Then I came across the bends to the crossing. What did you see when you did? Not much, at first. I was looking at the river. Well, it's, it's not much of a river. More of a creek, I suppose. But it gets pretty deep in spots, and it can flow pretty quickly. Most folks go to the main road because there's a bridge, but this way is much quicker for me. But anyway, when I looked back in front of me, I saw the truck. Just the truck? There was nothing around it? And not when I pulled up, but I could see no one was inside it. I thought that was weird, but maybe he ducked into the trees for a leak. So I jumped out to see if I could find the driver. And... That's when I saw the blood. James scratched his beard and closed his eyes. If you need to stop, I, I understand. Nah, no. No, it's... It's just... You never expect to see anything like that. You know? James takes a deep breath and a drink of water. It was all over the side of the car. A white truck, so it, it stood out. I couldn't look away for a second, but I was pretty worried for whoever the driver was. I thought they must have cut themselves really bad getting out or something. I, I don't know. It sounds dumb now, but uh, there's not supposed to be anything out here that can... Uh, that can do that. James has become pale and requests a short break to gather his thoughts. Uh, sorry. I must seem like a complete pansy. No, not at all, James. It's it's fine. It's perfectly natural to be traumatized by what you saw. Thanks. Anyway, I might as well get it over with, eh? I, I looked around a bit, seeing if I could see any signs of the bloke from the truck. I, I honestly missed it at first. It just looked like meat when I noticed it. 
The grass off the track is pretty long, and I was... Well, I was looking for a... for a person. There was blood everywhere. All over the grass. It looked like one of those documentaries where a lion eats a zebra or whatever. I couldn't control my feet. Like, I didn't want to get any closer, but my feet were moving that way by themselves. And what did you find when you moved closer? Just... Chunks. Pieces. I didn't even recognize it as a person. Until I saw the feet. They still had boots on. Everything else, though. I threw up and ran. I jumped back in the car and floored it out of there. I drove back. At this point, James paused and frowned. Uh, James, are you okay? I... yeah. Yeah. I just thought of something, is all. Something about the scene? Yeah. It was late in the day, so the sun was on the way down. Almost gone, actually. I had the lights on when I peeled out of there to head back and get the cops. There's this waddle across the river. Old, shiny thing. Really low to the ground and really bushy. I must have blocked it out in my panic. When my lights flashed over it, I just remember... There was something there, like the light reflected off eyes. My contact also put me in touch with the ME's office handling the body. The official report was yet to be completed, and the chief examiner who had flown in refused to even speak with me. But one of his assistants was a concealed local who splitted me her own autopsy notes, kept for her own portfolio, over a coffee. I've edited for contents, names, and locations, but her words are unchanged. So if it appears disjointed, that's on me. Medical Examiner's Notes John Doe believed to be Mr. Smith of 123 Town Road. Base on identification, found at scene of death. Body found outside vehicle. Vehicle undamaged and running. Massive trauma, not consistent with car accident. Subject completely decapitated. Head not recovered at scene. Confirmed identification not possible at this stage. Body presented in three large sections. Abdominal organs missing, lungs and heart almost unrecognizable. Spine completely severed between L2 and L3. Several lumbar vertebrae also appear to be missing. Left leg separated from body at nexus of hip joint. Flesh surrounding wound is ragged. Indicates tearing. Very little skin remains. A large amount of flesh appears to have been removed from the body, particularly the organs and the large muscle groups in the legs and glutes. Left leg, which has been removed, shows almost no remaining flesh. Reports of blood on ground at scene and little remain in the body. Indicate severe bleeding at time of death. Forced to remove leg extreme. Hip joint severely damaged. Wrecking force likely. Cause of death. Impossible to determine in this stage, beyond severe traumatic injury. Marks on bone suggest consumption or scavenging of the body. Possible explanation for flesh removal. Body does not appear to be old enough to indicate scavenger activity. Predation. But why? Notes from scene indicate signs of struggle. Dr. Williams indicates decapitation from singular trauma as likely cause of death at this stage but accepts the remains are so badly dismembered we may not know. Hair of unknown origin found on remains. Dr. Williams organizes to send samples to lab in Canberra, not on-site facility. Dr. Williams indicates farming accident as cause of death. Fails to account for discovery of remains away from farms and farming equipment. Fails to account for missing organs and flesh. Dr. Williams refuses to acknowledge his oversights. Objections not noted on official records. Dr. Williams has arranged for the remains to be flown to Canberra for more extensive investigation. Remains sealed and placed under guard. All staff asked to leave the premises. It's vague to a point, because even in private notes, 
You don't want to put forth anything too crazy. But it was enough to set off a knot of dread in my stomach, knowing what I did about the sightings of a strange creature in the area. So, based on the assistant's notes, I did a little research of my own. I knew for sure it wasn't a farming accident. The decapitation of the body, like the carcasses elsewhere, along with the obvious signs of predation, ruled that out entirely for me. The pattern didn't match any of the known predators in NSW. It didn't, in fact, match any predators in Australia. Well, we don't have many, to be fair. Dingoes are exceedingly rare around here these days, if not gone entirely, and much like wolves, they have a methodical approach to breaking down a kill, whether they brought it down or came upon a dead animal. Feral dogs are savage and lack any of the hierarchical sensibilities of wild canids at a kill, and that could explain the bestial way in which the remains seem to have been attacked. Of course, I don't know of any dog capable of decapitating a grown man with a singular traumatic injury, as the sitting M.E. apparently believed. Beyond that, the only other land-based predator in this whole country capable of taking a man is the saltwater crocodile, an animal we definitely don't have in NSW, and one that takes its kill into the river. That one terrible death opened up a whole bunch of questions and it seemed like no one had any real answers. Rumors spread like a summer bushfire, though, and enough people were on alert that when the beast showed up again a few days later, I found myself front and center for the show. They had finally, it seemed, cornered the terrible beast. But as before, when victory seemed assured, the beast slipped through their fingers. The hunting party fired and fired, so much that there seemed no conceivable way for the beast to escape being struck. And yet, when they entered the clearing, there was no body, no sign of blood. Surely, they thought, this was their proof. The beast of Gevudan, to the people upon whom it preyed, was nothing less than the devil itself. Excerpt translated from letter, unknown author, 1792. It seemed that the police had stopped taking reports of the creature seriously, and as a result, my phone and email were unundated. For the next week, I managed to track sightings roughly westward, although why anything would be heading that way at all, I have no idea. Maybe this thing was headed for the rapidly dwindling lakes and rivers further out or maybe for the desert itself. My own research into animals, extant or extinct, that could even remotely describe what had been seen, came up mostly empty. There were a few similarities, but mostly impossibilities. So I started looking into mythical stories, and that's when I remembered the Beast of Gevudan. It had always been one of my favorite monster stories as a kid, but time I distorted the details. Rereading it, though, so many things seems to fit. Huge beasts, animal deaths, savage kills, decapitations. It seemed an almost perfect match, except that it happened in the south of France over 200 years ago. I guess over hundreds of years, coincidence becomes much more likely. Still, I filed it away in my mind, just in case. Then I started putting the most detailed or interesting sightings in chronological order, hoping to guess the next move. I was sick of arriving after the thing had moved on. Date, 12 one Approximately 200 hours. Location, withheld details. I was driving along the road near dusk when something on the shoulder caught my eye. The road here is a sharp dip between two small hills, so it was a bit darker than the road either side of it. It was hunched over roadkill of some kind. I'd never seen an animal like it. It was big and black, and for a moment I thought it might be a big feral pig. But then when it moved, it was no pig. It must have been almost as tall as the car. Reported as the 2012 Holden Astra 
in a hunched position. Before I got much more of a look, it shot off into the scrub so fast, like the high beam startled it. It didn't move like anything I'd ever seen before. Date, 12-1-19. Approximately 23-30. Location, provided. Details. Me and some of the boys were out the back of the farm, spotlighting ferals. We'd had some sheep taken for a couple of nights, so we were out looking for the culprits. But we aren't seeing much. About 11.30, we heard this god-awful racket. Kind of like this babbling scream. Real close. Never heard anything like it. And we all sort of froze. I felt it in my chest. And the bloke with the spotty starts scanning the tree line back and forth really slow. But we didn't see much. Just chalked it up to one of those sounds of the brush, you know. Every so often out here, something weird pipes up. It happens. So we kept driving around. A few minutes later, the same scream, louder and closer. It's like it bounced around the countryside. Sound out here is weird like that, but one of the boys, he reckoned it kind of sounded like it came from behind us somewhere. So we turned the spotty back there and... Holy shit. Maybe 200 meters or so behind the UTE is this massive black thing. It looked at us for a second, and then, name removed, panics and takes a crack at it. This thing tears off into the tree line, faster than we could swing the light. It was on all fours, and it must have been maybe five feet in height. Thick black fur, and big eyes that shone green in the spotlight. The way it was behind us like that, I almost felt like it was stalking us. We got out there real quick. Haven't been back out since. Date. 14-1-19. 2025. Location. Provided. Details. I saw a huge animal crossing the creek behind my farmhouse around sunset. It looked about the size of a large bull, but it was certainly not any sort of bovine. It had thick blonde hair, and all the way along its back the hair looked almost raised. Like a razorback. Its legs were long and quite thick, and I think it had a tail. It was hard to tell, because it was mostly walking away from me, so I also never saw the head. I thought it must have been a huge razorback. But then it left over the creek completely, and I realized it couldn't be any boar. The creeks from bank to bank is only small, about two to three meters wide, but no boar could leap like that. Whatever the animal was, it creased the hill quickly and vanished from sight. Date, 16-11-19, approximately 0645. Location provided. Details. I'm a truckie, and I got myself caught up behind an accident on the highway, and wound up running late. I was going to sleep at the truck stop, but location removed. But I must have been three or four hours behind, and I was wrecked, so I figured I needed to park somewhere and catch some sleep. I pulled into a random rest stop before it got dark, cooked up a bit of food, and grabbed some sleep. Woke up about 6.30 in the morning to continue the trip. I lay there for a bit, thinking about going and brushing my teeth and all that before heading up the road to find Brecky. Then I heard something outside. It's real quiet out there. No one else is around. And I swear I could hear, like, huffing breaths. So I moved the curtains and climbed up front. And I damn near wet myself. Outside, sniffing at the bottom of the door... Is a genuine monster. The thing would have come up to the window on the truck if it stood up. It was like dark brown and black and filthy. It must have smelled me inside the truck, but it hadn't seen me yet. So I crawled back behind the curtains. The thing outside did something and the whole cab shook. It takes some strength. It started scrabbling at the door or maybe the step. And I was scared I might try and get in. I realized the glass was breakable. So I yanked the cord from the horn and gave it a blast. This thing gives a horrible howl. And I stuck my head out from the curtain 
in time to see it heading off at a decent clip into the trees. I took my chances and got the truck out there before it could come back. Didn't even stop for a piss until I'd gone about 200 kilometers. Date, 18 Time, not given. Location, provided. Details. I saw the creature cross the road in front of me at night. It came right to the left across the highway, near location removed. When my lights hit it, it slowed down a bit and looked straight at my car. It wasn't there long enough for me to get a good look at it, but it looked like it had pointed ears and sort of a stub snout, sort of a stub snout thing, and it had big eyes that reflected the light really brightly. It was huge. Then it was across the road, and I just kept driving. Date. 19 Approximately 0300. Location provided. Details. We farm pigs for shows and that sort of thing mostly, now that we're older. The land hasn't been much good for stock since the big drought in the late 90s. All told, we kept probably 30 pigs at any one time, and a couple of barns and sheds around this place. This night in particular, I was woken up by a bit of ruckus coming from one of the barns. I almost thought about checking it out, but it cut out pretty quickly. Not even long enough to wake the missus. And I guess not long enough for me to really wake up and properly think about it either. And sometimes the pigs get a bit short with each other across the pens or get startled by a fox or a possum snooping about. And I just thought that was what must have happened. I'd heard the stories, but I never expected what I found in the morning. I just thought people were going a bit loopy. But then I woke up the next morning, and one of the sheds near the house had the back wall torn completely out. Even from a distance, I could see the carcass of a pig over one of the rails. When I got in the shed, at least two pigs were dead, and the rest were nowhere to be seen. Whether they fled or were somehow taken, I don't know, but there should have been six large pigs in that shed, and there were none. The bodies were in a proper state torn up and shredded, and even just being sheet metal, it would have taken a lot of strength to destroy the back wall, and nothing natural can do that to pigs. Not here, anyway. It looked like a scene from that movie about killer lions back in the 90s. Uh, we rang the police, but they wanted nothing to do with us. So I'm reaching out to you, because folks around town tell me you're looking into all this, and I'm not sure where else I can turn. Date. 23119. Time not given. Location provided. Details. We're having a bonfire on our farm at location removed with a few friends. It was a fire ban, so I hope sharing this doesn't get the owners in trouble. But that's not the important thing. Late at night, when the fire started to mellow down and most people had gone to sleep in the shears' quarters, we started hearing these horrible sounds out in the distance. There were howls like a big dog, but other sounds too. Sometimes whatever it was shrieked, like how I imagined a banshee. Other times it was like a gargling scream. We were all terrified and went inside, but it kept coming closer and getting louder. After a while, we could hear it clearer and we could also hear it snarling and making this kind of barking growl or roar. It sounded really aggravated and really dangerous. We'd switched off all the lights, but no one was game to go out and put the fire out, so we just hoped it wouldn't attract whatever we could hear. Without the lights, it was really dark, and we couldn't see anything, but we could hear it. It got to the point where it sounded like it was right outside and then something brushed up against the shearing shed wall and snarled. I don't think any of us were breathing, trying to make no sound at all. Whatever was outside walked along the sidewall, snarling and sniffling, and then as it walked out in front, a bit of a shadow passed in front of the window as it walked by the last bits of fire. Suddenly, it gave such a loud howl that my ears felt like they'd burst. I don't know if it didn't like the fire, or it heard something, or... Or what? But it let off that massive howl and it must have headed away, because we started to hear it getting fainter again. In the morning, we could see the ground around the fire had been scratched at, 
but there was no other sign anything had ever happened. Date 25119 Approximately 2315 Location provided Details I think your creature was on top of my water tank last night. We had an enclosed porch, and in the summer I like to sit out there and have a whiskey or two before bed. Last night, my dogs who live under the house started going off like nothing else. They'd never done that before. Even when foxes get in the yard, they tend to just snarl and growl or even ignore it. Last night, though, they were going crazy. And then they just stopped. One or two of them whined, and I heard that shift further underneath the house. I heard them shift further underneath the house. Then I heard a clang out by the tank. We don't have much light out in the back of the house, but I flicked on the yard light anyway, and I had to look around. Nothing on the ground, but right on top of the old corrugated iron water tank, there was a dark shape. That was all I saw at first, and if it was just that, I, I wouldn't have thought twice. But then it must have opened its eyes, because clear as day, I got eye shine reflecting the yard light. It was looking straight at me, or at least at the house. Then it jumped straight off the tank. Our tank is about six meters tall at the top, and it just threw itself right off. I barely even heard it land, although it was definitely big. Then it headed off into the darkness somewhere. All of these accounts seemed to be clearly linked to the animal I'd been chasing, and they all took place along a path heading west and slightly north. Based on that, and based on the timings, I thought I might be able to intercept it if I got there fast enough. It seemed as though it was passing through a collection of mostly dry lakes and creeks within a day or two, and I resolved to beat it there. I really didn't know what I was in for, but I had gone too far now. And I had to know. I honestly still don't know how I lived to tell this story from this point onward. When Jean Castell finally killed the beast with his silver bullet, he spawned a legend. Many hailed him as a hero, and the attacks, miraculously, did indeed end. But still, the people would not be entirely satisfied. For Jean Castell himself had a reputation as a beast, and some began to question his motives. Some said Castell had raised the beast himself, only able to kill it because it trusted him. Some said that Castell had loosened the beast, a trained monster, to exact bloody and random retribution for some perceived slight. And others, well, they said that the beast of Gevodan, the Loup Garou, had been Castell himself all along. Albert Dumas, in A Treaty Regarding Werewolves, 1813 Before I could follow the trail our unknown monster had left, someone knocked on my hotel door. A young guy stood there, uh, his jaw set but his eyes nervous. They widened a bit on seeing me. Uh, um, are you... Have you been looking for the monster thing people have been seeing? He stammered. That's me, I smiled, trying to disarm him a little. How can I help? He looked puzzled for a moment, but quickly attempted a recovery. S sorry I just expected, well, uh, someone else. Can I come in? Or we can go down to the bar if you'd prefer. Uh, sorry, uh, strange men asking to come in is probably not ideal, huh? His awkwardness was kind of endearing, so I let him in. Thanks. I'm Aaron, by the way. He extended his hand, but tentatively, like he wasn't sure if that was the right thing. Tom, the stockhand is my brother. I was my brother. A sadness came over him then, as I took his hand, and my heart broke a little. I'm sorry. Has there been any news? I knew there hadn't, but I felt like he could use a little hope. Aaron shook his head. I know he's gone, if he was even alive when he went in the brush. It's been too long in this heat. That's why I'm here, actually. I, I want to help. With that, his jaw set again, and his eyes hardened. 
He may have been young and a little awkward, but he had the spirit of a proper country boy, tough as nails. I heard you're chasing the thing uh, all over the countryside. I've got a four-wheel drive and an ATV, and I've got a couple of 308s. He spoke with such venom that I doubted his intentions. Admittedly, a proper four-wheel drive would be a lot more useful than my Toyota SUV, and the security of rifles that could drop a Razorback sounded awfully good. But I had no idea what I might find, and I wonder whether I could deal with an impulsive young guy who wanted revenge. I sat Aaron on the couch in the room and squeezed his shoulder. Look, Aaron, I understand that you're hurt and that you're angry, especially when the cops are apparently pretending this whole thing isn't even happening. But whatever is out there is genuinely dangerous. I've got no idea where it comes from, what it is, or what it wants. But I know that tackling it fueled by emotions is only going to get people killed. So, that's a no. He looks both angry and crestfallen, so I try to be more diplomatic. It's not a no, and it's not a yes. Look at it from my perspective. A strange young guy I've never met finds me at my hotel and wants to help me find an animal that probably killed his brother using his four-wheel drive and his guns. I don't know you at all. I don't even know that you are who you say you are. I'm giving you some advice, more than anything. I sighed. Let me ask around. Uh, think of it like references for a job, okay? I've got a couple of hours before I have to get going, and I can think of a few people I can ask. Just hang out in the bar or something, and be ready to go, because if I do say yes, we'll be straight on the road. Aaron cheered up a bit then, and muttered his thanks erratically shaking my hand as he stood and exited, promising that I wouldn't be let down. Secretly, I hoped he was right. The idea of running into the beast alone didn't sit well with me at all. Thanks to the barman and pub manager, as well as his brother's employer, a few other townsfolk I'd build up a rapport with, and the wonders of social media, Aaron checked out. I still had concerns about his emotional state, obviously, but... As the day wore on, I realized how foolish it would be to tackle this chase alone. Aaron seemed more relieved than anything, and I took that to be a better response than gung-ho excitement. At least he didn't seem insane. Within half an hour, we were on the road, Aaron behind the wheel of a large, raised four-wheel drive. His shyness had yet to evaporate, so I asked him about himself in an effort to get him out of his shell a little. He had no issues talking to me once I asked the question, which encouraged me. I wanted to have at least some kind of rapport with the guy if we were going to be hunting monsters. Then I realized how insane the whole thing was. I was a failed biologist turned journalist hunting monsters. Holy shit. Aaron laughed when I mentioned it. Well, at least it's not boring. He started to warm to me a little after that. We talked about growing up and... We talked about his brother. He was well-spoken, clearly smart, and seemed really interested in my path through life. Living out here, he said, there was really only ever one or two options. You farm with your parents, or maybe you go somewhere else, but it's always related to the land. Everything's about the land. I never get the chance to explore anything else. Would you have if you could? Hell yes. I mean, the farm is what it is, but it's not exciting. Science sounds cool. Discovering things and all that. I think I could do that and be happy. Is that what you wanted to be when you were little? He blushed a little. What? We all wanted something silly when we were kids, Aaron. It's not that. It's... I just... I kind of wanted to write plays, like, like Shakespeare. I couldn't help myself and choked out a short laugh. Aaron glared at me and went beet red. No, uh, sorry. I'm not laughing at you, I, I promise. I just had this image of a guy in a flanny rounding up cattle and shouting Shakespearean prose at them. It's just so incongruous. His glare turned to a grin, and he burst out laughing. Anyway, what's so embarrassing about wanting to write plays? I think that's a great thing to want to do. 
I'm better than most kids. I guess it's just not the done thing, he said. It's not manly. Out here blokes are supposed to be blokes, and you know? I was the weird kid who enjoyed Romeo and Juliet at school, and that got me quite a few bullies. Well, maybe when this is over you can write a play about it. It can be a horror story if we're right, or a black comedy if we wind up catching a straight Rottweiler. Around us, the country started to flatten out. Not yet truly desert, it may as well have been, after a scorching, dry summer. Sun-bleached grass rippled in the hot breeze, and desiccated scrub hissed and rattled as the wind blew through its parched leaves. We were surrounded by different shades of brown and red, and despite being oddly beautiful, it just reminded me of just how remote and alone we would really be out here, over four hours' drive from the nearest decent town. All alone, in the path of a monster. The sun had fallen noticeably in the sky. By the time we reached the dirt track, Aaron said would take us into the heart of the rapidly evaporating lake country. Near the road, we were momentarily surrounded by a surprising burst of green, owing into the still-flowing creek system that spilled into the lake system when the rains allowed for it. Quickly, though, the landscape became arid and rocky, dotted with gnarled shrubs and the odd stunted eucalypt. It looked almost Martian, with no real signs of life for miles around, but I was sure the beast would pass through here. We pulled up on a dry spit of land between two shallow, dry lake beds and began setting up. Before leaving town, we'd stopped in at a farm belonging to one of Aaron's uncles, a pig shooter. He had several carcasses on hand and we'd taken a couple, hoping to use this as bait for the beast. Before the sun lost its heat, Aaron set around scattering the four carcasses around our campsite, no more than 250 meters away, and no closer than 200. We wanted to be able to see and shoot the creature if it showed up, but we also wanted to be at a distance if we could. The sun still had an hour or so to bake the carcasses, creating what we hoped would be an irresistible scent in such a lifeless place. With little else to do until nightfall, Aaron decided to cook some food as the sun finally started to sink. It was a fine line. We wanted to attract the beast, but we didn't want to be caught out by it. I had no doubt it remained active during the day, but from our slightly raised position, we could see out over the lake beds for miles while the sun stayed up. It seemed like a good idea to eat whatever we could before the sun dropped, and with it, our visibility. We ate quietly, anxiety setting in. I didn't know if the beast would come through that particular night or not, but I felt certain that if it passed within smelling distance of that rotting meat, it would head straight for it. They say dingoes can smell carrion from four to five kilometers away, and from all reports, this thing was much bigger than a dingo. As Aaron packed up the camp stove and the remaining food, I started a small, slow-burning fire with some of those hard-packed, hardwire store fire logs made from sawdust. I'd heard the one story about the thing investigating a fire, so I figured it couldn't hurt. Then, we settled into the back of the four-wheel drive, seats flat, and guns nearby, to watch a blazing red sunset and wait for whatever might come. The moon wasn't full, but in a cloudless sky in the open, arid outback, it gave us plenty of light, much more than expected. I could almost make out the black smudge of at least two baits against the whitish salt deposits on the lake bed, which almost glowed with reflecting moonlight. I almost started to worry that it might be too bright, but the creature had shown no signs of being but the creature had shown no signs of being overly skittish. Around about midnight, I started to drift off. Boredom had well and truly overwhelmed the nerves of earlier in the evening. You can catch some sleep if you like. I'll keep watch for a few hours. I'm used to sitting out in the dark, waiting for pigs and foxes. Damn it. I'd hoped Aaron hadn't noticed. Then again, it would have been really hard not to, given we were sitting a few centimeters from each other in the back of a four-wheel drive. No, it's okay, I whispered, not sure how much noise I could safely make. 
I pull all-nighters more often than you'd think. Bad time management. I do wish we'd thought to make some coffee, though. Aaron held up a single finger, rummaging around under the folded down seat, before coming back up with a thermos. They're probably not much better than warm by now, but caffeine is caffeine, right? Holy shit, I could kiss you. I thought. I thought he blushed a bit at that, but I couldn't really tell in the darkness. The coffee was strong and lukewarm, and I slammed it down like a shot, letting the caffeine work its magic. Once it had, I turned to my companion. Maybe it was just the natural curiosity of a journalist, but based on our earlier conversations, I felt like I needed to understand him better. So, Aaron, mind if I ask you a personal question? I mean, there seems to be a better than ever chance we could get eaten by a monster together. It's only fair I get to know you a little. He chuckled nervously at my gallows humor. Sure, uh, why not? I shifted into a more comfortable position, facing him instead of sitting so I could look out the side window. What's your deal? Why are you out here? I get wanting to be here right now, but beyond that, you're obviously smart, uh, well-spoken, well-read. You don't strike me as being happy to stay on a farm your whole life. You're not a kid, either. You could do whatever you liked. Go wherever you wanted. So why stay? Aaron sighed, and for a moment, I thought he might not answer. There's a few reasons, I guess. Family is one. It's, it's hard enough to move away from them as it is but I reckon it's harder for country kids. I thought about leaving a lot, but I could never bring myself to. He paused, sipping his own, no doubt, cold coffee. Beyond that, I think I feel like, as a kid, I needed to prove myself. I coughed a lot of shit all throughout school. I was girly because I liked Shakespeare and Mark Twain and poetry or whatever. I wasn't tough because I didn't really join the sports teams. I was less than a man because I never had a high school girlfriend. I suppose all that made me want to prove myself at the same thing everyone else was doing. Beat them at their own game, so to speak. If they were going to stay out here and work the land, then so was I. It might sound small-minded, but it was important to me. I think it's perfectly natural, especially to want to change the way people who have belittled you in the past see you. I took a moment to scan the moonlit landscape, searching for movement. Anyway, I bet if some of those high school girls could see you out here, ready to take on a vicious beast, they'd be a bit more interested. He broke into a full-on grin at that. Oh, the problem was never their lack of interest. It was mine. Oh. Oh. I found myself blushing this time but Aaron saved me from making even more of an idiot of myself. Your turn. Biologist to traveling reporter of oddities. How does that happen? Isn't it hard on your family, your partner, or whatever? Well, I haven't gotten much of either, to be honest. I'm an only child, and my parents moved to New Zealand when I was at uni the first time. I'm doing science. I, I guess I started doing that because... I felt like it was the best way for me to indulge the part of me that loved the idea that something could be hiding in the darkness, or in the jungle, or in the deep seas, or wherever. When it turned out to be a lot more banal than that, I turned to stories and history. I felt like this way I could keep feeding that part of me that loved the darkness. Well, you found plenty of that out here. Just then, a sound cut through our whispered conversation somewhere out on the empty plain. A howl, more powerful than I'd ever heard before, slashed the silent night air. Aaron and I shared a look, wide-eyed as the howl rose to a ridiculous crescendo, far above what I thought an animal could create. As the terrifying howl died down, Aaron gripped my shoulder firmly and pointed slightly to the south. At first I couldn't really see what he saw, but as I squinted, I noticed a large, dark smudge moving across the barren landscape. 
It appeared to be heading for the bait set 200 meters to our south, and even at that distance, I could see my earlier joke about stray Rottweilers had been well off the mark. The beast had arrived. This creature was clearly much larger than any ordinary dog, and the way it moved as it got closer reminded me more of a hyena. Loping and easy. It made a beeline for the carcass and stayed at enough of a distance that I couldn't make out a lot of other details. Still, it seemed to give off an energy, or maybe my own body had a primal response to the beast. Looking at it filled me with a gut-clenching sense of fear and an uneasy, anxious nausea. Small hairs on my neck and arms stood up with the prickling of goosebumps, and my muscles began to twitch. I realized they were flooding with blood as a result of adrenaline. My body wanted me to run. It recognized the situation even if I didn't. In the face of the beast, I was nothing more than prey. Aaron, strangled in the silence by fear as well, gently handed me a rifle. The original plan had been to open the door and fire from outside the four-wheel drive, but I got the distinct feeling that that had gone out the window. I had no idea how firing from inside the car would affect us, but I sure as shit wasn't opening that door with that thing 200 meters away. He slid open the rear window and mentioned for me to do the same with the middle window. Now, I fired a few guns in my time, but in that moment, palms slick with sweat, I doubted whether I could hit a shed, let alone a moving target at 200 meters. Through the night vision binocular Aaron passed over, I could see my target much more clearly, although details were still difficult to make out. It loped along like some kind of hyena-canine hybrid, a distinctive and strange form of locomotion that made me think, briefly, of the allegedly extinct thylacine. Any similarity to the legendary marsupial predator ended there, though. The beast was far stockier, and had thick, tufted dark fur. It ran with its head down rather than up, as I'd expect from any of the canids I knew. I thought of a wolverine or a badger, but longer, more languid and massively supersized. It had closed the distance to about 500 meters or so when it stopped. I heard it make the cackling, chattering scream that witnesses have reported, a demonic, alien sound so unnatural it made me feel ill. And then, to our horror, something responded in kind. Another chattering shriek rose from farther away, somewhere to the northeast. We weren't dealing with one beast. We were dealing with two. And we were all alone in a barren wasteland, stuck square in the middle of them. Even now, some 200 years on, there are those who refuse to believe that the beast was a mere wolf. Some agree that Castell had bred and trained a vicious, beastly dog. Others suggest the descriptions of the animal indicate a brown hyena, or perhaps a sub-adult lion. Then there are the werewolf enthusiasts, as we veer into the preposterous, who believe that Castell himself actually became the beast. One particularly interesting theory put forward into the years after the attacks even suggests that Castell had made a pact with the devil, summoning something truly evil and binding it within the body of a Gavardun wolf, creating something halfway wolf and halfway demon. Unknown Author, Website, 2008 The second beast's call faded slowly, leaving a ringing silence in its wake. Aaron and I were dumbfounded, scouring the plain for any sign of the other visitor while keeping one eye on the shadow of the first. Is that it? Right back there? I choked out, barely making a sound at all. Try as I might, I couldn't pick out anything that I could definitely identify as alive. My attention suddenly snapped back to the first animal. It had reared up on two legs, like a bear. No more than 100 meters from the carcass it had been approaching. My already thudding heart almost leapt out of my chest, 
On the ground, it looked large, but upright. It was just massive. Maybe seven feet tall, and as broad as the shoulders around a country rugby player. It seemed to be scoping the area out. It couldn't have missed the car parked on the empty plain. But after a moment, it dropped back on all fours and crossed the remaining distance to the first bait in a flash. It didn't waste any time either, tearing straight into the carcass with a savagery we could hear, even at that distance. Snarls and snapping bone are an unpleasant soundtrack, and it got worse when the other one sounded off. It was much closer now, I realized, as I snapped my head around. Somehow, it had crept almost up to the carcass on the north side of us, while we watched the other one. With ever-growing horror, I realized it was even larger than the one to the south. If this one stood up, I'd have guessed it would get to about eight or nine feet, and maybe 25% bulkier. It chattered and whooped like a demon, tearing into its own meal. I'm a fucking journalist. What the hell am I doing here? I thought, overwhelmed by terror in the face of the beasts. Aaron's expression seemed to reflect my own, but to his credit, he gently took the binocular from me and focused on the closer, smaller creature. Sliding open the window as slowly as possible while still moving it, he motioned for me to move further towards the front of the car. I nudged my own rifle and inclined my head towards the other creature, but Aaron responded in the negative. For whatever reason, he wanted to take them on one at a time, and I deferred to him as the experienced hunter. Having opened the window, he eased the rifle out, sighting the beast and blowing out a steady breath. What followed was nothing but complete madness that's pretty blurred in my memory. The force of the shot in the semi-enclosed space kicked me in the chest and blanked my hearing for a few seconds. The beast at the end of the barrel twitched violently, rolling away from a direct hit and pouncing to its feet. The one behind us let out a violent shriek and shot to a standing position. Seemingly looking straight at the four-wheel drive, it had been concerned, in a way, that one or both of these creatures had been shot at before and had run. I didn't want to have to track it again, but for some reason, they behaved differently this time. Its cry was answered by a wounded, enraged howl from the animal Aaron had shot, as the larger of the two tried to work out what had happened. Then the wounded beast charged straight at the car. It's amazing how small a distance 200 meters actually seems when something monstrous is charging headlong at you. It felt like the beast would be on us at any moment, but somehow, Aaron managed to slam the bolt back and chamber another round. His next shot was as true as the first, bowling the beast over, and his calm skill with the rifle surprised me as he sent the three remaining rounds into the sorely wounded monster before I could find its feet. Then I found myself smashing against the inside of the four-wheel drive, safety glass showering my face as something hit it with a tremendous force. With a bellow of rage, the larger of the two animals had rammed the car with enough power to lift it onto two wheels for a moment. Aaron yelled something, his voice unintelligible, as it joined the crunching of glass and the roaring of the beast. The rifles had been sent clattering around the inside of the car. Aaron bounced around with every enraged impact as he desperately tried to grab the unspent weapon. Finally, his hand closed around it, just as the beast shoved a wickedly clawed limb through the broken window, slashing his upper arm, and eliciting a howl not too unlike its own. The fact that the creature didn't have proper hands probably saved him. Without the ability to grasp his arm, it simply pawed at him, unable to pull him any closer. Every time he aimed the rifle, though, the thrashing paw nearly knocked it out of his hands. He shouted something vaguely recognizable as vicious obscenities and rammed the butt of the rifle into the searching limb, causing it to draw back. The head of the thing loomed above the roof of the car, out of sight, and I had a sudden flash of possibly suicidal inspiration. The ATV, I shouted. We can't stay here. It's going to rip the car apart. He nodded as the creature dropped, 
trying to get its blunt head through the broken window. Trusting that he'd been ready, I threw open the door on the other side of the car, just as the remainder of the window gave in, and the massive, savage head of the beast burst through. Aaron and I both managed to get out just before I could close those huge jaws around either of us, and I put my head down and sprinted for the ATV faster than I had ever run in my life. I jumped on the front and whipped my head around as Aaron piled into the back with his rifle, just in time to see the beast extricate its head from the mauled car and send a smoldering glare in her direction. And nothing had ever made me happier than that ATV starting up straight away. I don't think I'll ever be that happy ever again. And I'm completely okay with that. It had been a while since I'd driven one. And I had a momentary panic as I envisioned myself freezing under the pressure and being devoured right next to a perfectly functioning escape vehicle. But thankfully, that didn't happen. And I let out a scream of raw triumph as we roared off into the dark night at a truly unsafe speed. The plan roughly formed in my head, had been to get some distance between us and the creature, so that Aaron could shoot it from a better, less intimidatingly dangerous spot. I quickly saw, though, how difficult that might prove when Aaron tapped me on the shoulder and gestured behind us. Not only had the beast taken pursuit, it was keeping pace with the ATV, and in the dark on the rough ground, I didn't think I could go much faster. Can you shoot it on the move? I shouted, and Aaron shrugged noncommittally. Is that a fucking yes or no? No answer came, and I had to turn my attention fully back to where we were going. The land may have been barren, but I couldn't think of a worse time to put a wheel in a wombat hole and flip the fucking thing over. Behind us, the thing giving chase had started that chattering cry again. Fuck me, it's gaining on us. What? I can't go any faster. I'll kill us both. So will that fucking thing. I wanted to scream. I knew the ATV could go faster, but with the deceptive terrain in the dark night, I couldn't do it. With the beast now gaining instead of just keeping pace, though, I didn't really have a choice. Just as I started to throttle the thing up, Aaron leaned in my ear. Fuck it. We'll have to go into the lake bed. I looked to the left across the wide expanse of flat land. It would be a huge risk. There could be thick mud underneath the crust, ready to trap us like flies in honey. But if it stayed hard, we might have a chance. Of course, it would also involve slowing down and turning left, giving the monstrous beast a chance to get even closer. When we turn, slow down for as long as you can, Aaron said. I'll have a chance at hitting it. Maybe... I wanted to snap back, something about how useless maybe was in our situation, but he'd already started getting himself into the best position he could to shoot a rifle on a moving four-wheeler driven by a journalist. I probably made it difficult, if I'm honest, but I followed his instructions and made the turn. I couldn't help but look towards the creature as I did, and once again regretted it. The eyes shone in the moonlight, silvery and savage orbs set in a blindingly fast shadow. Then the rifle cracked, and it stumbled. Maybe more out of hope than realism, I thought Aaron might have pulled off a miracle kill shot. I almost stopped, but the beast gathered its feet rather than falling. I swore and gunned the engine again, but this time the monster did something different. I'm not sure if the death of the other one had rattled it or if the shot had genuinely wounded it. But instead of coming back at us, it swerved hard to the west, loping off into the night and quickly dropping down the slightly raised land between the lakes and out of sight. For the time being, at least, we could breathe again. We made our way back to the campsite, slowly and diligently, hyper aware of the possibility of an ambush. On the way back, we stopped to try and gather up the body of the dead creature what we found, though, made absolutely no sense. It was a dog. Nothing but a normal, everyday dog. A little bigger than expected, sure, but definitely not the massive animal that we both saw. I started to wonder if I was losing my mind, but Aaron pointed to the tracks in the dirt, 
Huge pawed pug marks that didn't match the dog in any way. We weren't losing our minds, but there were so many questions. Unfortunately, we had very few options. The damage to the four-wheel drive was extensive, and we couldn't shelter there with a wounded monster on the loose. We didn't know if it would start, and the damage meant that we would have to go change a wheel before we could go anywhere, and not something we could really do given the circumstances. Plus, a wounded animal is often the most dangerous, and we didn't know who else might be within range or where it might head next. I'd already come to the same conclusion, but Aaron voiced in. We're going to have to track it. End it properly. When his brother went missing, the creature had seemingly left very little evidence of its passage. It seemed far less cautious, or maybe it couldn't avoid leaving sights on the brittle surface of the dirt lake bed. Either way, it left an obvious trail for us to follow, and we slowly stalked it around the dried lakes on the four-wheeler as the sun began to rise behind us always heading west. The rising sun gave me a bit more confidence, visibility improved, and the creature would find it much harder to hide in the shadows of the dark, rocky landscape. With an injured, violent animal somewhere ahead of us, any advantage it lost made me feel a lot better. Try as we might, though, we couldn't seem to catch up, even as the sun rose high and the heat of the day set in. Eventually, we had to stop and at least eat something. A long night of fear had taken its toll and I could have easily dropped right there and slept, even with the beast still out there. A few kilometers along, the ground became harder again, and the tracks became harder to follow. Aaron, the hunter, had to get off the ATV and track on foot, with me nursing the vehicle along behind and looking out for trouble. A few kilometers further, and we ran into a problem. It had been dry out there for a long time, but when rain does come, it comes in torrents. Often all that water finds a weak spot in the arid soil, and within a few days it can erode deep ravines as that rain makes its way into the river system. At about midday, we found ourselves standing on the edge of one of those ravines. Not a particularly wide one, mind you maybe twelve feet across and seven or eight feet deep, but enough to stop us in our tracks. Try as we might, we couldn't find any sign that the beast had turned away either. It seemed like it had gone over the ravine entirely. Worse, there didn't seem to be a way around the ravine anywhere nearby. We'd failed to chase the thing down, and it had gotten away. I hung around for a few more days, looking for any signs of the creature and the news out west. I wrote up a story, leaving out some of the more preternatural elements and focusing on the mysterious attacks. And in the last few weeks, I've submitted it to everyone I'd worked with for opinion. They all shot me down with odd phrases like, This article will not be in the best interests of the publication. I've never heard that said before, especially given I write stories about strange things exclusively. As for the creature, it seemed to have vanished, and I had to get home at some stage. So after almost a week with no more news, I figured I couldn't hang around any longer. I said my goodbyes to Aaron, left him my number in case anything new came up, and set off home. Three days after I arrived home, I received a phone call from someone with the Australian Federal Police. They were courteous enough, explaining that they had information I'd been involved with a feral dog incident out near Griffith and wondered if I mind answering a few questions. I played along with a conversation that seemed reasonably normal, except that the AFP doesn't usually get involved with that sort of thing and the words dangerously feral dog were repeated far too often. I felt as though the caller was trying to convince me that a feral dog had been the only culprit. I couldn't help but be unsatisfied. In a weird way, I touched on something I felt was preternatural. Some creature well beyond the norm, and I had nothing to show for it but a story that no one wanted to hear. The beast itself had left no evidence that might allow me to answer the questions I still have. Instead, I started scouring cryptid encounters again, hoping to find something that I could relate to what we'd been through. 
A lot of them were junk, clearly embellished or outright made up. But two had enough similarity to the case up west that they caused me to dig deeper. Neither had happened in Australia, but I'm not sure that matters. I don't think these events are tied to a place as such. The most recent happened in Maui 15 years ago, where a terror beast killed and maimed some 20 people, and the other began the killings in Gevodan in the 1700s that I wrote briefly about earlier. In both incidents, the killers were savage beyond normal predatory behavior. Descriptions of the killer were very similar between both, and seemed to fit our beast well. Of course, I could have easily dismissed these correlations as coincidental, if not for the way both cases ended. In Maui, they shot a hyena. In Gevudan, two wolves were killed. These animals match neither the description of the beasts or the patterns of the attack. The villagers in both cases are all well aware of what these native animals look like, sound like, and how they hunt. In both cases, they were convinced that the beast was not a normal animal. In the dry lakes of the western Riverina, we'd shot a bona fide monster, only to discover the corpse of a feral dog where it fell. In France, some blamed witchcraft claiming that black magic can be used to turn an animal into something more. I have no idea about all that, but I do know that the body of that dog lay in the midst of tracks that it could not have made. Something unearthly happened out in the barren lakes bordering the Australian desert, something I doubt I will ever be able to explain. I feel like we might never know how many times this has happened, given my call from the AFP, but I do know that we have two other recorded events that seem to match almost perfectly over the course of history. Who knows how many more have been lost, never heard of, or explained away. This is not the first time something like this has happened, and I'm certain it won't be the last. <laughs>